Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 1. Daniel 1, starting with verse 1, says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with the part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spoke unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding, science, and such has, as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So we see here, is a very, very dark time for the nation of Israel, for the nation of Judah. The King Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged that city and took all the holy vessels from the temple into his treasure house. Now, I want to ask you this question. As I was listening to people share their prayer requests this morning. I kind of wondered how can this message fit into all the needs of the people here today. And I thought of a question. The question I want you to think about is this, my friends. How is your spiritual life affected by crisis? When you encounter a crisis in your life, whether it's a family member that dies or you have someone that goes to jail or whatever it may be, how is your spiritual life affected? What do you do when you feel like you're forsaken by God? Do you forsake Him? You know, the Hebrew youth, they, they, as they're taken captive, I could picture them being bound and they see all the evidences around them, burning buildings, decimated temple, the, the vessels taken out, all evidences show that God is no longer with them. And there would be a temptation, friends, to think that since God has forsaken me, what's the point? What's the point of going on any, any further? And my friends, I want to let you know that the story of Daniel is there for us to help us to know what Daniel and his three friends did in a crisis such as that. They chose to remain true to God no matter what. Will you still remain true? You know, Satan will do everything he can to shake your faith. Did you know that? He will do everything he can to, to make you feel that Everything is so discouraging and so traumatizing that you feel that i got to let go of God because it doesn't feel like God is there. My friends, Daniel chapter 1 tells us that just as the vessels from the house of God are taken out and kept in the treasure house of God, so are the Hebrew youth taken out of Judah and kept in the king's palace. It's kind of interesting that those two are mentioned. The vessels and the youth. And I could go into that a little bit more, but that's not going to be my focus. But notice, not just any youth did King Nebuchadnezzar take, but he took, listen to this, captives specifically picked from certain of the children of Israel. So there are specific ones that he took. Those of the king's seed and princes. So these were captives of what kind of families? Royal families. Royal families were taken now as captives to now be taken into the palace of this Babylonian king. And notice as a king takes the very best looking, the most influential, the most cunning, the most wise youth for what purpose? To educate them in the way of the Chaldeans. 
And King Nebuchadnezzar was determined to, de to prepare them to be fully qualified for, for filling important positions in the kingdom and to assimilate them into Babylonian culture and society. And how would he accomplish this? Well, Nebuchadnezzar's task was to subtly brainwash the Hebrew captives so that they would be conditioned, re-educated, and indoctrinated to be loyal subjects in the Babylonian courts. And he would achieve this through three methods. And the Bible tells us what these three methods are. Method number one, let's look at verse four. Children in whom was no blemish but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and in the knowledge and understanding and science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So what's the first method? To teach them the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now how many of you here are bilingual? Okay, a few of you are bilingual. Let me ask you this question. Those who raise your hand, do you dream in English or your language? Huh? <laughs> I asked my wife this question when I was preparing for the sermon because I was kind of curious because she was, of course, in Korea. She spoke Korean. And I asked her, when you were in Korea, what, did you dream in Korean or English? And she said, oh, I dreamed in Korean. Like, How about now? Now it's more like a little both and more English. <laughs> and it was very interesting, my friends, that Nebuchadnezzar was so wise. He knew that if he could get these youth to understand the language, they would have to be immersed completely in the culture of Babylon. Imagine if you went to Spain and there was no one that could speak English there. You had to change your laptop to the settings, not English, but to Spanish. All the labels around your house has to be in Spanish. When you go to the businesses, you have to talk to them in Spanish and look at the merchandise in Spanish. What's going to take place after a while? To survive, you're going to learn Spanish. This is going to come naturally over time, right? And so this is what King Nebuchadnezzar does. His first method is to get people, these young people, to speak this language to the point where they can even dream it in their language. And method number two, we see verse six. Now among these were the children of Judah, D Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. Now, what did he do? He changed their name. Now, you know, my friends, you may think that that's not really significant, but it's very significant because in Isra the Israelites believed that names were synonymous to a person's character. And what did this king do? This king gave them different names, Babylonian names. And these Babylonian names, well, Daniel, look at Daniel. His name means God is my judge. And that was changed to Belteshazzar, which is which means Bel has protected, and Bel is a Babylonian god. Hananiah, his name means God has favored, and his name was changed to Shadrach, and that means the command of Aku, and Aku is the moon god, Babylonian moon god. Uh, Mishael, it means who is, who is what God is, and his name was changed to Meshach, which now means who is what Aku is. Again, the moon god. Azariah, his name means God has helped. And he was, his name was changed to Abednego, which means the servant of Nebo, which is the god of wisdom. So what King Nebuchadnezzar was do doing by changing their names, he was changing their past. He was trying to erase their past, erase memories of their god, erase the concept of who they really are so that he could build them up into the character that he wanted them to be. Method number three, verse five, we see, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. And my friends, it's very interesting. If you look at that word, nourishing, 
right? As a king is trying to provide the king's food and wine to these youth, the word nourishing in the Hebrew actually means, in Hebrew context, means to twist, to twine a cord, to make great. And so what King Nebuchadnezzar is doing by having them eat, by nourishing them, he is actually twisting and twining and preparing them for greatness. And so it's very interesting that the king is taking a motherly role to nourish and bring the youth to have affections and loyalty to the king while there are characters, while their characters are being molded and magnified through Babylonian education. In all this, the king thought he was not only showing them great honor, but securing for them the best physical and mental development. The Hebrew captives were all escorted into the royal banquet hall, and there was a wide array of food fit for a king. And Daniel and his three friends notice a problem. The food provided on the king's table were swine's flesh and other meats, which were pronounced unclean by the law given through the law of Moses. And when the Hebrews were forbidden to eat this, here Daniel, knowing that here Daniel was brought to a severe test. Should he adhere to the divine teaching, offend the king, and probably not only lose his position, but his life? Or should he disregard the commandment of the Lord and retain the favor of the king and thus secure great intellectual advantages and the most flattering worldly prospects? A severe test indeed. What would you do? What would you do? You know, Daniel could have argued that Dependent as he was on the king's favor and subject to his power, there was no other choice but to eat of the king's meat and drink his wine. But Daniel and his fellows counseled together, and they considered how their physical and mental powers would be affected by the use of wine. The wine, they decided, was indeed a snare. Also, secondly, these youthful captains were aware that the king, before eating, always asked the blessing of his gods upon the food. A portion of the food and also the wine from his table was set apart as an offering to the false gods whom he worshipped. According to the religious ideas of that day, this act consecrated the whole to the heathen gods. So Daniel and his three brethren thought that even if they should not actually partake of the king's bounties, but as a mere pretense of eating the food or drinking the wine where such idolatry was practiced, would be a denial of their faith. To do this would indeed implicate them with heathenism and to dishonor the principles of the law of God. That brings us to Daniel chapter eight, um, chapter 1, verse 8, which says, But Daniel, what did he do? Purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor which the wine that he drank. And we see that Daniel knew. Daniel knew that the food and the wine would defile him both physically, his body, and spiritually. It would affect his relationship with God through the presentation, uh, through, through being tempted to be involved in idol worship. Now, no doubt, my friends, I believe that Daniel and his three friends knew their Bibles. I believe that they were diligent Bible students. And I believe that as they were standing there in the king's banquet hall, that they were, this particular passage came in mind. This is what I think, okay? So turn with me. Keep your thumb in Daniel chapter 1, but turn with me to, to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 23. I wonder if they recalled this passage while they were standing in the king's banquet hall. Proverbs chapter 23. And let's look at this. 
Proverbs chapter 23, which reads, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. And put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Verse 6. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire his dainty meats. Verse 10. Remove not the old landmark, and enter not into the field of the fatherless. For the Redeemer is mighty, and he shall plead their cause with thee. Applying thy heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Verse 20, be not among winebibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Verse 29, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in the cup. When it moveth itself aright, at last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Wow. You know, people may scoff at passages like these, but, you know, recent science is proving that the Bible is right all along. You know, there are many uh, studies, recent studies, by the Center of Disease Control that revealed that pork is indeed unfit for consumption because it is so riddled with diseases and parasites and toxins just by what the pig eats and in its biology. They have no sweat glands. So all the toxins remain in their flesh. And, and you know, my friends, God created the pig for a specific purpose. And the purpose of the pig is to be the nat nature's garbage collector. It collects all the filth and the excrement and the garbage of this world. And God knew what he was saying when he says, do not eat that thing. Because he knows where that pig has been. And what that pig does. And you know, that's why we need to follow the Bible. Also, you guys probably heard when they said red wine was good for the heart. Well, recent article said that that red wine study was, most of the data was falsified, right? A University of Connecticut researcher known for his work on red wine benefits to cardiovascular health falsified his data in more than 100 instances. And nearly a dozen scientific journals are being warned of the potential problems after publishing his studies in recent years. Officials said Wednesday, U University of Connecticut officials said that their internal review found 145 instances over seven years in which Dr. Depak Das, who's a doctor who is in question, fabricated, falsified, and manipulated data, and the U.S. Office of Research Integrity has launched an independent investigation of his work. And if you don't believe that, here's another study, another article says that drinking alcohol does not result in a net health benefit at all. In fact, it increases the risk of alcohol-related cancers by 51%, according to a study of almost 115,000 people from 12 countries. It also showed that heavy drinking increases the risk of death by 31% to 54%. And the highest rates of harmful alcohol use are often seen in the lowest income countries. And so we see here that even people that do not study the Bible through scientific research have discovered these things. But the Bible has told us this many, many years ago, many, many long time ago, right? Now, verse 9. <clears throat> now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Then Daniel said to Melchizedek, the prince of the eunuchs, had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants. I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink, and then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, that the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. 
So he consented to them in this matter and proved them 10 days. This is what some people call the Daniel diet. Just pulse, vegetables, fruit, water. The Daniel diet for 10 days. There's a quote here. <coughs> In youth instructor, among professed Christians today, there are many who would decide that Daniel was too particular and would pronounce him a narrow and bigoted. They regard the matter of eating and drinking as of too little consequence to require such a decided choice, one involving the probable sacrifice of every earthly advantage. But in the day of judgment, those who reason thus will find that they turn from God's express requirements and set up their own opinion as a standard of right and wrong. They will find that what seemed to them unimportant was not so regarded by God. His requirements should be sacredly obeyed. Those who accept and obey one of his precepts because it is convenient to do so, while they reject another because its observance would require a sacrifice, lower the standard of right, and by their example, lead others to regard lightly his holy law. My friends, you cannot pick and choose what, which of God's commandments you want to follow because it's convenient. You have to follow through with all of them if you are truly a follower of Christ. Amen? And so there's no compromise here. Daniel knew that. In the Babylonian courts, he knew that there was no co compromise with this decision. People would think, oh, you know, that's a, such a little thing. Such a little issue to actually make a big deal out of. My friends, why are we in this situation now? What was the very first sin? It had to deal with a piece of fruit, didn't it? Something so small and minute like that, and here we are as a result of that. My friends, disobedience to God's commandments can only lead to one thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, Whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, whatsoever you do, do all to who? The glory of God. That's right. That should be our driving purpose, our driving motivation to, to honor God in all that we do. And the desire... The desire to honor God was Daniel and his three friends' key motive, as should be ours. If it is truly our desire to honor God in what we eat, drink, and do, then there should be a corresponding change in our lifestyle, especially in our eating habits. Ooh, now I'm getting to sensitive topics here. Don't stone me, okay? Wait till after Sabbath. But Philippians 3.19, let's turn there. Philippians 3.19. <clears throat> Philippians 3.19 tells us, a description of the enemies of the cross of Christ. Philippians 3.19 tells us, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Did you catch that? It says that who is their God? Their belly. And those such people, destruction is waiting for them. You know, my friends, either everyone, regardless of who you are, everyone is controlled by one of two powers. We are either controlled by the higher power of reason and the will of God, or we're controlled by the lower power, which is appetite and passion. One of these two are what dictates who is in control. And you decide which one has the pre predominance, reason or conscience or appetite and passion. These two forces are always in opposition with one another especially for the Christian life. So my question to you is this. Are you in control of your appetite, or is your appetite in control of you? <laughs> Maybe if you see a chocolate cake. <laughs> How do you react? Do you say, oh, I got to get to that? Or do you say, oh, wait a minute, that's, that won't be good for me right now. Um, I really want to, but I know I shouldn't. Have you felt that? 
tension. Yeah, you can relate to that. Those are the two powers at work. Those are the two powers that are at odds up with one another. You know, Phyllis, when you told me about walking your dog, this reminded me of that. If you, Phyllis, do you mind if I share what happened to you? Okay. Like Phyllis, she, um, if you know her story, she was walking her dog one time and the dog took off and you fell down, right? And your brother's dog pulled you down as you're taking it for a walk, right? And so when she, when, when she said that, I was like thinking, you know what, this is just like this illustration that I'm trying to convey. It's like taking a dog out for a walk. How many of you guys have dogs? Okay. When you take your dog out for a walk, who's in charge? <laughs> who's in charge? Are you in charge? Does the dog follow you or do you follow the dog and can pull around by the dog? My friends, that's what your appetite is like. Appetite is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. God gave us appetite. God gave us the ability to eat. Praise the Lord, right? But if appetite is perverted, that's when things get wrong. If you allow appetite to control you and it overrides your mental power, your reasoning powers, you are just being pulled every which way by the desires of the flesh. And here's a quote here. It says, there are many in the world who indulge pernicious habits. Appetite is the law that governs them, and because of their wrong habits, the moral sense is clouded, and the power to discern sacred things to a great extent destroyed. But it's necessary for Christians to be what? Strictly temperate. Now, that sounds scary, the word strictly temperate. But as Christians, that's what's required of us. They should place their standard high. They should place their standard where? Do we lower it a little bit? Set it high, right? Temperance in eating, drinking, and dressing is essential. Principle should rule instead of appetite or fancy. Those who eat too much or whose food is an objectionable quality are easily led into dissipata dissipation and in other into other foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men into destruction and perdition. So Spirit of Prophecy always advises against overeating, snacking, eating between meals because it overtaxes the digestive system and the stomach is always working and it never gets rest. And what happens to that stomach? The stomach starts to get digestive problems, indigestion, it starts to get ulcers, it gets all these problems that results of constantly making your stomach work all the time, never giving it rest. Right? The, and also, to digest your food, it requires what? Blood. Right? So if all the blood is going to your stomach to constantly do the work of digesting, if you constantly snack between meals, you start, constantly eat between meals, you constantly keep putting food in your mouth, the blood does not go to your head where it's needed. And that's what the Bible means when it's saying that the stomach is their God. The stomach has more priority over the mind, right? And so here's a quote. It says, those who have received instruction regarding the evils of the use of flesh meats, tea and coffee, and rich and unhealthful food preparations, and those who are determined to make a covenant with God by sacrifice will not continue to indulge their appetite for food that they know to be unhealthful. God demands that appetite be cleansed and that self-denial be practiced in regard to those which things are not good. This is a work that will have to be done before his people can stand before him a perfect people. A perfect people. Intemperance is the reason for the majority of sufferings in this life, friends. It annually destroys tens of thousands. Intemperance is not limited to only the use of alcohol or drugs, but intemperance also includes the hurtful indulgence of any appetite or passion. You know, thousands today are suffering the torture of physical pain and wishing again and again that they have never been born, but God did not design this condition of things, but it was brought about through the blatant violation of nature's laws. The Bible says, be not mocked. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you reap. Cause and effect. If you put poison into your body, you know what the cause will be. 
and if the appetites and passions were under the control of sanctified reason, my friends, society at large would be completely different. You know, true temperance, true, true temperance teaches us to abstain entirely from that which is injurious, that provides absolutely no health benefit, and use judicially only healthful and nutritional, nutritious articles of food in moderation. So even good things can be bad if you have too much of it. Right? There's like a radio program of this lady who was trying to win a contest, and they're trying to see how much water she could drink. She was drinking lots of water, and before she knew, before we knew, they found out, she died from water intoxication. Too much of a good thing can also be detrimental to your health. So there needs to be temperance. There needs to be moderation. And this is what God asks us to do. Now, some people think, this is a, a good quote, the plant-based whole foods diet is extreme. Half a million people a year will have their chests opened up and a vein taken from their leg and sewn onto their coronary artery. Some people would call that extreme. It's all because of the choices people make, you see, about the appetite. Appetite is the key ruler in their life. The reason why so many people are sick and dying is because the results of their wrong actions, which are dictated by their appetites, which if not under the control of the reason and the will of God will lead to destruction. People are eating themselves to an early grave. The Bible says, put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. You know, I want to share something with you. When I was a young person, I used to love Doritos. I'm not putting a plug in for Doritos, okay? But I used to love Doritos, and especially nacho cheese. And I remember that I would eat the bag of Doritos, and after a while, I'd be like, okay, I got to stop. And I said, one more. Okay. And I was, I was addicted. I was like, okay, one more. And I kept eating. And before I knew it, I ate the whole bag. And it was a big bag. And I ate that bag, and guess what happened? I, I started to get, soon after that, I got a fever. I got sick. I don't know if it was because I, I overdosed on sodium or MSG or whatever it was, but I got sick. And then it happened again. On another occasion, I ate the whole bag. I got sick again. The fever returned and all that other stuff happened again. And that's when I realized, man, that's a lesson that I got to learn <laughs> or else this is going to keep killing me. But you know what? <laughs> Daniel, how old was he when he was taken a captive into Babylon? He was about 17 or 18. Not very old at all. He's very young. You know, yet without his parents, he was able to stand alone with his friends. You know, how was that possible? How is that possible that an 18-year-old can stand so firm in his principle to not even eat and indulge in the food that was presented before him? That's right. That's right. The principles of temperance need to be carried into the home. And parents must set an example of temperance so that self-denial, self-control should be taught to the children from babyhood. And and first, it is important that the little ones be taught that they eat to live, not live to eat. Did you hear that? Do we eat to live or live to eat? Appetite must be held in check to the will, and that, must, that will must be governed by calm intellect and reason. Children are, taught, are to be taught that their wills are not to be made law, nor their whims to be continually indulged. So why is temperance important? Why is temperance important? Some of you guys are probably thinking, why are we talking about this? Usually we talk about this on an evangelistic series. Okay. Friends, it is very important. Here's why. I'll give you three reasons and we'll close. Turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. Something as little as appetites. Why is that a big deal? 
2 Peter chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 6. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Now, if you know this passage, actually, let's read verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Are you there? Okay, it says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, what? Temperance. And to temperance, what? And to patience, what? And to godliness, what? And to brotherly kindness, to what? Sure, that's right. So we see that temperance, notice where temperance is. We, we know this as the ladder of sanctification, right? Where is temperance? Temperance is right before what? No. Patience. Pa temperance is right before patience. So God wants to lead us to a higher character development, friends, to be fitted for heaven. But if we don't exercise temperance, we cannot make it all the way. Here's why. Because if we don't exercise temperance, an intemperate man cannot be a patient man. And we see that in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. How does it describe God's last day people? It says, here are the patients of the saints. Patience characterizes God's last day people. But friends, we cannot be patient unless we learn to be temperate first. Because Peter makes it very clear that temperance comes before patience. If we cannot control our habits of eating and drinking and our lifestyle, we cannot be temperate. We cannot expect to reach that, that, uh, that next step on the ladder. The, temp the temperance comes before patience. And if we want to be called saints, I want to be called a saint. Do you want to be called a saint? If you want to be called saints, we need to be patient, and we cannot be patient if we're not temperate. And to achieve this, we must be willing to act our part to turn away from the things that are detrimental to our health, that per perverts our appetite, that and we need to replace the bad with the good. And God's grace, my friends, is given to us to work in us to will and to do his good pleasure. Can you say amen? God's grace is there to help us to work and to will his good to do his good pleasure, and we need to cooperate. We need to cooperate. And so temperance is a part of character development. Number two, why is temperance important? Our health is connected to spiritual life. Our health is connected to our spiritual life. You see, my friends, our bodies are these vehicles for our brains. And it is through our brains that God communicates to us. And if our mind and our brain are being somehow altered so that we cannot be susceptible to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, to hear God's voice speaking to us, my friends, we are putting our spiritual life at risk. So if we wish to have communion with God, we must take care of our bodies and brains. If we abuse our bodies, we destroy ourselves both physically and spiritually. The whole question of health itself is how we take care of our bodies, the temple of God. It's a moral issue, friends, one filled with eternal consequences. Care for our health is a vital part of our relationship to God. Now, obviously, there are some aspects of our health that, that are beyond our power. We have defective genes. We're, ex we're exposed to chemicals or, or damaging agents, and we're at risk of physical injury that may damage our health, but God knows all this. God knows all that. He knows where we're at. But to the extent that lies within our power, we are to do our best to maintain our bodies made in the image of God to be in optimal health. Amen? Now, okay, this is, uh, I'll come back to that one. Let none who profess godliness regard with indifference the health of the body and flatter themselves that intemperance is no sin and will not affect their spirituality. Have you heard that? People say, oh, there's no connection to 
what we eat with our salvation. A close sympathy exists between the physical and the moral nature. The standard of virtue is elevated or degraded by the physical habits. Any habit which does not promote healthful action in the human system degrades the higher and nobler faculties. You know, Daniel could have found a plausible excuse to depart from his strict temperate habits, but the approval of God was dearer to him than the favor of the most powerful earthly king, even dearer than life itself. Number three, why is temperance important? Temperance is empowering the higher powers to rule appetite and passion. Temperance is empowering the higher powers to rule appetite and passion. So I want to ask you this, friends. Are you struggling in your spiritual life? Are you feeling that you are not getting the victory over your temptations? Paul tells us that temperance must be in control so that we are in the condition to overcome. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Turn there with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're drawing this to a close. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. Let's read verse 24. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do there say amen? It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but, in one, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we and incorruptible. Verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means which I have preached to others, I should be a castaway. You see, my friends, Paul understood that in order for him to be fit for this race that he was to run, and by the way, we are all running this race, right? Because he says that what is the prize when you win this race? What is the prize? An incorruptible crown, which we receive when we're in heaven, right? An incorruptible crown. And so Paul is telling us for us to be able to make that a reality, we need to be temperate in how many things? All things, right? And he also says what he does, he says, I discipline my body. I keep my body under subjection, right? So that's where we want to be. This is the secret to overcoming sin and temptation, and friends, the Apostle Paul says that we are called to run this race. And so my question to you is, how do you prepare for a race? Do you just uh, eat what you please, drink what you please, lounge around in front of the TV, sleep late, oversleep? Is that what you do? Is that how you train for a race? <laughs> Some of you guys are laughing. <laughs> okay. No, my friends, you change your habits, you change your lifestyle for that event, right? Everything goes and revolves around that event because you want to be at your optimal best and you don't want anything to hinder you from achieving that goal. You, will, you want to give your total best and nothing less. And that's, that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that we need to be temperate in all things and this is what we are required to do. And it says here that the Lord, in uh, Messages to Young People, page 147, the Lord will cooperate with all who earnestly strive to be faithful in his service as he cooperated with Daniel and his three companions. Fine mental qualities and a high tone of moral character are not the result of accident. God gives opportunities, but success depends on the use made of those opportunities. The openings of providence must be quickly discerned and eagerly entered. There are many who might become mighty men if, like Daniel, they would have depended on God for grace to be overcomers and strength and efficiency to do their work. Okay, this article caught my eye. Barney Laplace was a 40-year-old bodybuilder. Like, uh, 
you know, those bodybuilders that flex in front of the people get paid to flex, right? <laughs> and um, he thought at the age of 40, it was time to retire because he was, he, he felt like he lived the best life and he's like kind of slowing down, he's winding down and it seemed like the right thing to do to retire at that age, so he hung up his posing trunks for good, or so he thought. But when his partner, Josie, the UK's strongest woman in 2010, there's a picture of her up there, and Barney turned to veganism, everything changed. These days, I train half as much, do half as much, but get better results. Why? Only one answer. Going vegan, GMO-free, organic, my body is running perfectly. We felt even more uncomfortable being bodybuilders and consuming meat and animal products in far greater quantities than that of normal people. This was another reason I thought about retiring, retiring from bodybuilding. However, thanks to being a vegan, I have just as much strength and power as before, but I have less fat and greater lean muscle mass, plus better, better energy and endurance. My recovery is much better, and I feel excellent all the time. My training sessions are on fire every time, which is significant improvement as I used to feel very lethargic and uncomfortable in my carnivorous diet. I am the best I've ever been and suffer no delayed onset muscle soreness after heavy sessions. Now I feel awesome. There were many reasons I went vegan to begin with, namely mass farming methods for mass consumption, not to mention my digestive issues. I was getting constant hiccups and pain in my stomach as my hernias were being irritated by meats. Now I feel lighter and never in discomfort or bloated. How many vegans do you see getting heart attacks or high blood pressure? I was thinking about my health, too. And this is what he says. This is what he testifies to. A vegan diet did wonders for him. And when he said that, when I read that article, it reminded me of this story in Daniel chapter 1, how the, Daniel and his three friends also did that diet for 10 days. And, and in Daniel chapter 1, verse 15, it tells us what the results were as a result of those 10 days. Daniel chapter 1, verse 15, and at the end of the 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus, Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king hath said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. The king communed with them, and among them all there was none found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all manners of wisdom and all understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. My friends, it's amazing that what God can do to, tho to those who are loyal to him. God honors those who honor him. And how do we honor God? One practical way is through what we eat and drink, what we put in our bodies. Because believe it or not, it affects our spiritual life. At the end of the 10 days, it was astounding. I don't know if Daniel, it says that they were, they were um, what does it say there? Their, their countenance appeared fairer, and they were fatter in flesh. Now, that word fat doesn't mean obese fat, okay? It means like they were firm. They were like healthy, right? Maybe they looked like that. I don't know. <laughs> and so... So we see that if you want to reach the highest excellence, of stan excellence in the standard of um, moral living, we need to first seek wisdom and strength from God, and second, observe strict temperance in all the habits of life. In the case of Daniel and his friends, we have a prime example of how principle can gain victory over temptation to indulge appetite. This prime example shows how we can gain the victory over the lusts of the flesh. Remember when I asked you, how are you doing in your spiritual life? Are you struggling with the lusts of the flesh? The way to actually address the cause of why you're falling into temptation is to address this very issue. By addressing this very issue, 
it will strengthen you and equip you to be more readily able to resist those temptations. This is a practical way, and it requires sacrifice. It requires sacrifice. You know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't have the health message to show people how to be healthy, strong sinners. We have the health message to show people how to be healthy, strong saints, saints that are patient. But to be patient, they have to be temperate. And we need to be like Daniel in our lifestyle habits. And this is true. Listen to me. This is true Christianity in practice. Many times we can say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus and all that stuff, but your lifestyle testifies far more than what you say. You know, Daniel. Daniel would not have been ready to face the lion's den if he did not stand firm for principle in this text. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah would not have been ready to face the fiery furnace if they did not stand firm for the principle in this one test. Jesus could not have faced the cross until he overcame in this area of appetite in the wilderness before the start of his ministry. And my friends, that same Jesus, that same Jesus wants to take you higher and further in your Christian experience. My friends, we can never get to the point where we say, I'm already here, Lord, or I'm fine where I'm at. I'm going to park it right here. The Christian life is a race. And a race, you always have to what? Progress. And Jesus says, follow me. As I have overcome appetite, I will also help you overcome appetite. Thereby overcoming appetite, you will be more able to overcome the sins that so easily beset you. The temptations that you stumble upon, you will now have victory over. Jesus will be there to strengthen you every step of the way. Do you dare to be like Daniel? Do you dare to stand alone? Do you dare to have a purpose firm? Do you dare to make it known? My friends, I want to ask you this simple appeal. Would you commit yourself, mind, body, and spirit, to a life of temperance to stand on principle? Perhaps there's an area in your life that you know that God, that you know that God is pointing out to you that needs to change. A change needs to take place, and you're asking now for his grace and help in time of need. If you want that grace and help in time of need, and you want to say, Lord, I want to address what you pointed out to me. I want to cooperate with you. I want to follow where you lead so that I can become more able to be like you in character. If that is your desire, I think it would be appropriate to ask you to stand as Daniel did. Without regard of what people say, would you want to say, Lord, there's an area in my life that I need to surrender to you, and I know that I have not addressed it, but Lord, please help me so that I can be better equipped to stand for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, as these people are standing here, I stand with them. Within our hearts are so much turmoil, a struggle. Lord, we want to do what's right. And oftentimes we fail. Lord, please show us in a practical way how we can overcome 
this small but big challenge of appetite and temperance and allowing our reasoning powers to be supreme in our decisions. Lord, we ask that you please speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. Lord, we want and desire to be closer to you in our walk. And so, Lord, we stand before you now, knowing that in and of ourselves we cannot do this, but we are standing because we want your help. Pour out your grace upon us, Lord, and help us to overcome in this area so that we can be like Daniel, to face the greatest test that waits for us to show whether we are your servants or servants to another God. Guide us, Lord, we pray from this point on. Show us how we can make positive changes that would glorify you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray.